We have a few minutes for some questions, so all right, any questions from the audience? Let's see if you're using your electronic or even um, you could use your uh, good old fashioned way with a microphone. Any questions? <clears throat> right there. When you see the uh, calcium in the, um, <clears throat> uh, on the scan, is there a way of determining the degree of stenosis in this particular area, or do you need a CTA in order to do that? Yeah, th that's a great question. Um, these scans, the calcium scoring is done without contrast. So no, we cannot actually tell you quantitatively uh, what the degree of stenosis is in that coronary artery. But in general, as the score increases, studies have shown that very high scores, for example, scores, you know, let's say greater than 1,000, have been associated with very good chances of having an obstructive plaque. So um, you cannot, on an individual scan, you know, relate the degree of calcium to you know, how much stenosis you expect on an angiogram but uh, it can give you a sense of the probability of having an obstructive plaque there. And in another study that Dr. Navi's group did uh, years back, if your score is over 500, in fact, we even say 400, uh, now, even if the patient feels well, <clears throat> if you do a nuclear stress, about a third or so will have ischemia. So actually, if you look at the new guidelines, they will approve a nuclear stress test in an asymptomatic patient if their score was very high, over 400, because of silent ischemia. Yeah, the question I have for you is, to follow up on coronary calcium score, the higher the coronary score, does that interfere with the CTA analysis of obstruction? Uh, that's a great question, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jones. Um, uh, definitely, you know, calcium is the Achilles he heel of coronary CTA. Um, there's a lot of effort um, with the vendors to address that issue with improvements in hardware and software. Um, in general, you know, I think our experience is, you know, as long as the score is maybe not greater than, you know, 500 or 1,000, we've been able to interpret and we do our best to interpret. I think the big key is also what Dr. Q showed you on his last few slides. We now have the opportunity here at Methodist to do CTFFR, which is really taking your CT data set, doing computational, a company does computational flow dynamics on it, and um, is able to kind of predict what an FFR of the vessel would be. And that is completely independent and is not um, uh, interfered by calcium. So in patients now, you know, theoretically, even if they're heavily calcified, we could do a CTA and we can get some functional information with this new technique, CTFFR. Okay, let me, let me take a question from the, uh, from the internet and then back to the frontier. Dr. Nabi, how often do you check calcium? <clears throat> on my patients in general? No, what's the recommendations now? Is calcium it five years, calcium every calcium five years? Uh, okay, okay, <laughs> there's a couple of questions. Uh, personally, I am a believer, so I frequently order it. Uh, if, you, if you stick with what the guidelines recommend, the guidelines recommend it as a 2B indication. That is when you are <laughs> unsure of your risk stratification after you've used the po pooled cohort equation, or as Dr. Jones had said, there are other factors in that equation that are not taken into account. What about that. repeating it? I think they there's- repeat Yeah, the question is oh, repeating, repeating it. Oh, you do it repeat. once, how often do you repeat? <laughs> repeat it oh, okay, for serial well, follow-up. Got it, got it. Okay, so that, that's an even more complicated question. Um, in general, I, I don't repeat because once I've, wait, let, let me, let me re reverse here. If the score is positive and that patient has now diagnosed with coronary atherosclerosis, they go on a stand therapy and for me now the, what's important is that they're on the right intensity statin and maybe you know what their LDL level is. If their score is negative, um, maybe I'll repeat in a period of five years uh, just to see you know, if they've converted and at that time, you know, particularly if patient is younger, right? If they're younger. If, if you're zero at 75, you're not going to worry about it. If <laughs> you you're zero at 52, you yeah. may want to do yeah. a five year follow up. That's right. true. That's you, right. you don't need it before five years. All right, so it's Correct. not a yearly Correct. test. It's not a yearly <laughs> test. <laughs> it's not a yearly test. <laughs> if, if I could ask a question, Dr. Jones, that I think many in the audience have, even I, you know, what if you start with the low, lower intensity <laughs> starting 
and you hit target and the, the LDL goes to 65, do you still go to the high intensity because the guidelines say that, or are you happy because the LDL hit the target? And that may be a question that a lot of right. primary care doctors have, and even I, even I have. Yeah, well, Ian, as, as I sort of put in quotes, you know, the lower, the better. I mean, it, it's, it's clear that there really is no low part in, in LDL cholesterol that a patient can't benefit. So yeah, you go to 65, you know, if you can go to 55, you can go to 45. So higher intensity statin, yes, to lower atherogenic lipoproteins, but we do feel that statins may have other benefits that are beyond what they do to atherogenic lipoproteins, because statins do reduce inflammatory burden, and they do have some effect there, which may have an independent effect on atherosclerosis progression or unstable plaques. And the higher the intensity statin, the greater the effect is on some of those non-lipoprotein benefits. So, yeah, if I would get the patient to tolerate as high intensity statin as they can, no matter what happens to their LDL. Question in the front. Uh, thanks uh, for all the great info. I feel like I'm on my own little stress treadmill here this morning. But a uh, question I have about the 2013 guidelines, um, they came out to a, a little bit of controversy in the literature, and you alluded to that, Dr. Jones. But I'm wondering if the updates are going to address like the risk calculator issues or if we're basically just going to have a lot more vague uh, uh, the pharmaceutical companies don't seem too upset about it. Yeah, but. yeah. No, I hope that they improve the risk calculator. Uh, there are some uh, further advances now in the calculator, and some have come out which seem to to be better at at uh, at appropriately estimating risk and not uh, underestimating risk in some uh, patient population. So I hope they modify that, particularly when it comes to ethnicity, where there are some specifics there. So I, I hope they do get better with that, and I think that I've been told that they that they will. And they will uh, return to measuring lipoproteins as part of your uh, uh, outcome. Uh, it was said that you just need to give a statin, which was fire and forget, give them a statin and walk away, and you didn't need to worry about anything else. No, I do think it is related to what those drugs do to lipoproteins that are important. And with additional data, you will have to follow. And as I said, the use of non-statin drugs will depend on knowing what those lipoprotein levels are. So they will readdress that. But I still think the four statin groups will still tend to stay the same. Uh, Peter, probably a last question before we move to the other one. And, and please feel free to ask the, the faculty offline what you need regarding the questions. Uh, Obviously, there may be a, a bump in diabetes, and the big question, the first one is, are we increasing the risk for people who have cardiovascular disease, or certainly, you know, we decrease the risk, overall benefit with statin therapy? Yeah, I, I agree. Even though there may be a risk of new onset diabetes, remember I told you that tends to be in patients who already have insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, they're high risk because of that. And although you're just pushing them a little further to, towards diabetes, we know that statin use in those type of high-risk patients, including diabetes and prediabetes, the benefits far outweigh that risk of slightly pushing them quicker towards diabetes. And I'll just tell you that that risk is about 12 to 20% chance of new onset diabetes over three to five years, not within the first six months of using a statin. So the bottom line is, prevent diabetes by doing other good things. Don't worry about the statin progressing to diabetes. Get them to lose weight, exercise, eat properly, do all the right things. That's how you prevent diabetes. That's my, my take. Well, let's thank our, our speakers for a wonderful first session. <laughs>